Misfit Nation, welcome to the Misfit Entrepreneur 2023 Year in Review, where each year I attempt to boil down all the incredible, useful information, strategies, and tips from our guests that they've given on the show into less than one hour for you, with a few surprises thrown in. Now, it's impossible for me to go through every single best piece of advice, and that's why I, I urge you to take some time and go through the Misfit archives to see which episodes resonate most with you. But in doing this episode, my goal was to spur ideas, to give you a lightning strike that propels you down a path of action to better improve yourself, your life, and your business or your career in 2024. And, th and that's why I do this show, not to only provide a treasure trove of some of the best information to succeed in life and business for my daughter, Hannah, for when she grows up, but to give you a place where you know you can go each and every single week to get inspired and find real tried and tested tips, secrets, and strategies to succeed in all areas of life and to share different perspectives from some of the highest performing entrepreneurs in the world with you. Their misfit side, as I like to call it. I truly believe that one great episode can change someone's life. And that's what we set out to do in this episode or this show every single week. And I'm going to do something a little bit different this year with this. I decided that I, I'm going to go through and went through each episode and I picked the top three most important lessons from each of our misfit entrepreneurs. So as I go through them today, I list each one and then expand upon them. So basically I'm doing my top three from every single Misfit Entrepreneur we've had for the past year. So this thing is jam-packed with some of the best content you're going to get to kick off your 2024 to help your success. But before I begin, I want to tell you something. I want to say thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Thank you for your support of the show. And thank you for sharing our message. Without you and the amazing feedback members of this audience give me every single week, it would not be half of what it is. And because of you, this show has now reached over a million people in over a hundred plus countries. I am truly humbled and in awe at all that we have done together. And I'm excited about having an even bigger impact with your help in 2024. So from the bottom of my heart, Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, so here we go. The 2023 Misfit Entrepreneur Year in Review. We started the year out in episode 336 with an incredible entrepreneur in Jess Stewart. Jess gave us a ton of great thoughts on how to build and scale a business, and here are the top lessons from her episode. The first, grit and hard work. Jess emphasizes the importance of grit and hard work, which she learned growing up on a cattle ranch. She highlights the significance of perseverance and the ability to bounce back from setbacks. The key lesson is not just about completing tasks, but ensuring they're done right, a valuable mindset for really all entrepreneurs. Second was differentiation and innovation. In building her medical billing company, Jess recognized the need to differentiate in a competitive market, so she chose to offer a total solution rather than piecemeal services, leveraging technology to really be a pioneer in electronic solutions for medical offices. The focus on innovation and being a first-to-market player played a crucial role in the company's growth and success and ultimately its major sale and exit. And number three was building a strong team. Jess talked about the importance of building a strong team and shares a great lesson about attracting top talent. She talked about the significance of understanding that individuals may prioritize meaning and purpose over salary and emphasizing the need for business owners, entrepreneurs to articulate their vision and attract the team members who align to their goals. Additionally, she emphasized the value of seeking mentorship and advisory support to enhance leadership skills and navigate challenges of effectively. After Jess came J. Halim Washington, who taught us what it means to live by the mantra, I won't starve. Here are my favorite lessons from his episode. Persistence and personal development. Jay made a big point about the significance of person per perseverance and personal development as critical success principles in business. He stressed the need for entrepreneurs to have the courage to do what needs to have to be done, continually learn, and understand different personality types for effective collaboration and creating successful partnerships. He talked about his I won't starve mindset. So this is point number two, I won't starve. And that's his mantra, right? And it encapsulates the determination and the resilience needed for success. It really emerged from his experience of being 
uh, judged and faced the challenges of being a convicted felon. That's right, he was a convicted felon before he became a successful entrepreneur. And it reflects really that commitment to hustle, learn, and defy odds, giving entrepreneurs really, you know, a mission statement, right? It's his mission statement, but we can all use it. I won't starve. Number three from Jay was strategic partnerships and joint ventures. Jay talked about the importance of creating and leveraging strategic partnerships and joint ventures to really propel business growth. And he talked about the need to set aside your ego, recognize the limitations of going solo, and seek collaborations that result in these larger mutual benefits, right? One plus one equals three. By identifying complementary strengths, helping others succeed, and planning partnerships strategically, Business owners, entrepreneurs can achieve incredible synergies that go way beyond their individual capacity. In episode 338, we heard from Dr. Sharon Grossman, who's the authority on helping entrepreneurs avoid burnout. I took three really important lessons from her, especially pay attention to number three. So the first was identify habits for success, right? So identity that you have and your habits for success. Sharon shared that the importance of understanding one's beliefs and building habits that align with the desired identity that they wanna have is critical. Breaking out of bad habits and the comfort of burnout involves recognizing those subconscious patterns, reshaping those fundamental beliefs and then consistently aligning actions with your desired identity that you wanna have and that you wanna be. Number two, customized solutions for burnout profiles. I thought it was really interesting when Sharon started to talk about the different burnout profiles. And there's three different ones. There's thinkers, there's feelers, and there's doers. And you have to customize really the solution for each one because each profile is different. Recognizing your burnout type enables individuals to implement targeted strategies. So for instance, thinkers may focus on letting go of control and increasing self-compassion. Feelers on setting boundaries and managing emotions and doers on slowing down and tuning in to self-awareness. Number three, the seven E's solution to burnout. Probably the most important thing that Sharon showed us was the 7E solution to burnout, which really serves as a comprehensive framework for managing and preventing burnout. The seven E's include emotional intelligence, empowerment, engagement, self-efficacy, energy, effort, and enlightenment. These elements collectively address mindset management, personal empowerment, productivity, belief in one's ability, self-care, efficiency, and mental centering to combat burnout effectively. If you have burnout or you feel like you have challenges in this area, this is a great episode to listen to. Next came Deepak Ori, who started as a kid in India selling Coca-Cola to his friends and ended up a renowned luxury hotelier. His three biggest lessons, number one, individualized understanding of happiness and luxury. Deepak's focus really a lot on true happiness, right? He thinks a lot about what that means and stating really that it's highly individual and a product of self-awareness. He encourages others not to mistake joy for happiness and he highlights the really the significance of knowing oneself. He also defines luxury as an experience that varies for each person really talking about the need for individuals to reflect on what experiences truly enrich them. What is luxurious for one person is different for another. When used correctly though, happiness can contribute to the success of any business. Number two, fearlessness, respect for opinions, and rule-changing mindset. Deepak discusses his fearless, really fearlessness regarding people's opinions, or what he calls ROPO, respect of others' opinions and the value of really uh, sharing that knowledge. He encourages breaking and challenging rules, but emphasizes doing so if aligned with your principles. The mindset really fosters innovation and a willingness to challenge the status quo that really is essential for success. The third thing he talked about was principles for life and business. He outlined some key principles for success, including things from a customer's point of view, right? Seeing and considering things from the customer's point of view, thinking logically, treating everyone fairly, trusting and caring for employees, and then making employees part of a bigger vision. I think that's a really key thing if you're building a business and you're maybe you're hiring your first employee, really make sure they understand the bigger vision and how they contribute and how they can be a huge part of making that come to 
into reality. And these principles reflect a customer-centric and, and really employee-focused re- approach, acknowledging the importance of fairness, trust, strategic vision in both life and business. And this is something that really every leader should take to heart. After Deepak, we heard from franchise expert Scott Milas. He shared a lot of wisdom, including these lessons. The first, risk, reward, assessment, and knowing your why. Scott really talked about the importance of entrepreneurs being prepared for the risk-reward dynamic in starting a business. And that involves thorough planning, including family involvement, really to avoid merely buying a job, especially in the franchise world, right? Understanding the motivation for opening or owning uh, a business is crucial and entrepreneurs must clearly define their why to navigate the challenges successfully. Number two, he talked about the different entrepreneurial archetypes, the visionary versus the process entrepreneur. So there's two different ones, visionary and process, and understanding your strengths, whether in delegating and running systems, which is more of a process entrepreneur, or building system and maintaining autonomy, which is more of a visionary, is really important in choosing the right path, especially when you're considering a different uh, type of franchise. And number three, the franchise strategy and the consulting benefits, right? He highlights the importance of choosing between franchising and independent entrepreneurship based on those personal strengths and preferences. Franchising can offer a structured system, but requires adherence to that franchisor's guidelines. Scott's process that he takes entrepreneurs through involves really educating clients on the nuances behind and beyond popular franchises because focusing on those personal goals and those financial aspects and those different archetypes and then guiding those individuals through that decision-making process is what really makes the magic happen. And he stated probably the most important thing in choosing a franchise that uh, is that it aligns with an individual's values and long-term vision. And it's not just the opportunity of the, the money that it can provide. Lubo Smid is a very interesting entrepreneur, having built and exited multiple businesses for millions while being an extreme athlete, sharing his adventures around the world. I took the following three lessons from our time together. Number one, maintaining a high bar and mental toughness. Lubo stressed the importance of consistently pushing oneself to higher standards in all aspects of life. His engagement in extreme sports and dedication to physical fitness not only provide stress relief and and energy, but also contribute to mental toughness. This mental resilience is really very important for entrepreneurs. We talk a lot about this on the show because we face high pressure situations, right, which require clear thinking, stress management, and and Lubo advocates for regular exercise is a fundamental aspect of an entrepreneur's daily routine. From my own experience, I can attest to the benefits of physical fitness for increasing your mental toughness and pushing you to higher levels and standards. Number two from Lubo was consistent performance principles. So he shared valuable principles for consistently performing at peak levels. These include internal dedication across all areas of life, the importance of recovery, both physical and mental, daily goal setting, end of day reflections and accountability partnerships. How you do anything is how you do everything, right? By developing these habits, entrepreneurs can enhance their performance, learn from experience and continually improve. And then the third point was around bootstrapping his business to 20 million and the persistence in the team building that it took to do that. So his his journey of bootstrapping his agency STRV to 20 million in revenue really talks about the importance of persistence and resilience. Building a successful company involves navigating challenging situations. And Lubo really talks about the the need for entrepreneurs to persist through the ups and downs. I've often said we spend a lot more time at the peaks or at the in the valleys than we do the peaks in entrepreneurship. And, and Lubo really, really highlighted this. He also emphasized the significance of building the right team, seeking out, surrounding oneself with the right people, and ultimately constructing a strong leadership team to guide the company through various stages of growth. Building mental toughness and building and surrounding yourself as an entrepreneur with the best people and the best team possible is a recurring theme that you're going to find from really almost every misfit entrepreneur. In episode 343, Serial entrepreneur Dean Gaida shared the following with us. He talked about creating a learning organization and leveraging the diversity of it. 
Dean credits the longevity of his business to creating a learning organization where people continuously grow, solve problems, and take initiative. He talks the importance of implementing process and fostering a collaborative culture where employees are excited to share ideas and ask for help. Dean also advised against hiring everyone with a similar mindset and really talked about the diversity of thinking needed to truly succeed. So leveraging a diverse team contributes to a broader range of perspectives and innovation inside a company. Number two, entrepreneurial mindset and commitment to grit. Again, recurring themes, right? Dean's key elements of entrepreneurial mindset include highlighting the need for courage to start and stay curious through the journey. He underscores the commitment to grit, emphasizing the importance of long-term focus, putting effort into controllable factors, and remaining open to opportunities. For Dean, it's all about being present uh, present and visible as a leader and practicing outside-in thinking, which are essential aspects of the mental game of an entrepreneur. And then third, strategic use of data. Dean shared the importance of utilizing data effectively for business growth. He he really talked about how entrepreneurs need to start with the fundamental data, such as like sales, marketing, click-through rates, target market segmentation, targeting the right audience early on is critical, critical, and focusing on industry, title, and group with the most pain that the product solves. He also shared that you should continuously ask why to interpret data, improve outcomes, and use the scientific method in shaping hypothesis testing and drawing conclusions. After Dean, Tannis George shared the lessons that she learned in growing her unicorn company through to a nine-figure exit. Here are the top three that I took away. The crucial role of co-founder partnerships. Tannis built her business with a co-founder, and that really, for her, made all the difference. And she credits that the success to that co-founding partnership. And she stated that they can be either the greatest asset or the greatest liability in a business. That really 65% of business failures result from issues between founders. So Tannis talked about the pivotal role that a strong partnership can play in propelling a business to levels that are unattainable with a single founder. And from my experience, I've found that my biggest entrepreneurial successes have come in the businesses that I've had great partners in. And that leads me to the next lesson from Tannis, elements of a great partnership. So key elements that contribute to successful partnerships include shared values and intentionality. Shared values are fundamental for alignment and intentional focus on the partnership is absolutely imperative for its sustained success. According to Tannis, great partners actively contribute to holding each other up during the challenges of building a business, treating the partnership like an ongoing invested mindset. And then in the third point, the third lesson, she talked about building successful partnerships. And she said, when it comes to building successful partnerships, she advised that entrepreneurs need to conduct a self-assessment to understand their needs and preferences in a partner. She developed a actually a tool for this to facilitate this process, which she shared for listeners in the episode. So if you're interested, go check it out. But she also said, exploring your network, attending meetups, and engaging in discovery sessions with potential partners are great ways to find that suitable business partner. Additionally, she said it's very important to discuss major partnership points and addressing legal considerations early on. In our next episode, we heard from Wiley McGraw, former professional baseball player, bull rider, and veteran of multiple tours in Iraq, Afghanistan, and other areas as a special ops soldier. It was tough to boil down his wisdom to just three lessons, but I did my best, and here they are. Number one, lead yourself first. Wiley stressed the foundational importance of leading oneself before leading others. Being a leader is about service beyond oneself, and to effectively lead others, individuals must first master self-leadership. Acknowledging personal truths, confronting internal struggles, and committing to self-improvement are essential steps to become an authentic and impactful leader. Number two, confronting internal lies. Wiley talked about the tendency of the human mind to deceive itself, leading individuals to accept and perpetuate internal lies. He said, we must confront these lies head on and that facing uncomfortable truths is a prerequisite for truly leveling up. Entrepreneurs, especially high performers, should avoid insulating themselves with yes men and instead embrace self-awareness to break free from limiting beliefs. And then number three, he shared some lessons from 
combat, and leadership. And drawing from his military experience, he shared valuable lessons for overcoming challenges and, and really pushing limits. Combat's different from the internal battles within ourselves, but serves as a sort of trial by fire, in some cases, literal fire, for growth leadership and really becoming a better version of yourself. According to Wiley, it's it's really rooted in service, self-mastery, and the commitment to confront and overcome personal limitations. The key is to embrace discomfort and see if the opportunity that is to become a better version of yourself is it's really always there, right? So you're always looking for that. You want to see that opportunity. Where can you become a better version of yourself today? Embrace that discomfort. Richard Newman is an award-winning author and entrepreneur focused on helping people understand the psychology of communication. The three lessons that I took from him start with mindset. So he talked about mindset being fundamental. I think, again, a recurring theme. We all understand the mind is where everything happens, right? Everybody's looking for this holy grail solution to all these different things in our lives and really the holy grails between our ears. And so from Richard's journey, he started out as a shy and slightly uh, autistic teenager and then became a successful entrepreneur, right? How did he do it? Well, he emphasized the transformative power of mindset, taking time for that self-reflection, determining your personal values and setting extraordinary goals provided him a roadmap for success. He's really proof that you can overcome just about anything if you want it bad enough. Second point was communication is about you. Richard shared his pillars of effective communication. They revolve around self-awareness. You should start by refining your body language, your voice, your choice of words. Importantly, communication should be targeted towards how one wants others to feel as an, after an interaction, really thinking of a win-win type situation. You must also ask effective questions and employ storytelling structures that resonate with human psychology. Understanding that the listener is the hero of the story can significantly enhance the storytelling impact. Presence in gravitas was number three. So he underscored the importance of presence when speaking or leading. People can enhance their presence by cultivating a present state of mind, reminding themselves of their values and avoiding seeking excessive validation. Maintaining gravitas involves physical aspects such as balanced and grounded posture. Entrepreneurs should be deliberate in shaping their mindset, protecting the best version of themselves and embodying the qualities that inspire confidence and engagement. In episode 349, affiliate PR expert Kayla O'Connor discussed the niche of affiliate marketing for PR, but she also shared great advice for success. Here are her three lessons. Align energy effectively. Kayla's journey is a great example of aligning one's energy uh, truly effectively, a concept that she discovered through what's called human design. By understanding your energy type and incorporating the knowledge into business practices, people can maximize their potential. Scheduling, creating a conducive work environment, and aligning with peak energy times are crucial aspects that can significantly impact productivity and success as well. Number two was the authentic PR strategy. Kayla shared that a key element of a successful PR strategy is authenticity. I think we've all heard that before, but what does it really mean? And so she said crafting an authentic message for both the entrepreneur and the business, along with serving the intended audience, is essentially it. PR serves as a third-party validation for customers, emphasizing the importance of a well-researched and tested strategy. The focus should be on understanding the audience, delivering authentic messages, and building a strategy that reflects values and goals. And number three, she talked about the integration of utilizing affiliate marketing. Businesses can enhance their PR efforts by integrating affiliate marketing through their strategy by joining reputable affiliate networks, setting appropriate commission rates, and leveraging tools like skim links that are really foundational to doing it well. Combining SEO strategies, focusing on trending content and keywords, and collaborating with quality influencers can also amplify the impact of affiliate marketing. The integrated approach really allows entrepreneurs to tap into broader audiences in different markets and create really meaningful partnerships. After Kayla came Meg Cassable, who achieved seven figures in her business by cutting her time in the business by over 50%. Wouldn't we all like to do that? So here are three lessons on how to do it. She said, number one, emphasize empathy in your SEO. 
Understanding the needs of your ideal clients and ensuring that your website reflects this understanding is very important for effective SEO and that helps to drive the business and cut down on time in the business from a lead flow standpoint, right? Position yourself as an expert solving specific problems and optimize your website accordingly as this will increase that, really that lead flow and your sales and cut down your time. Number two, niche down and define your audience. Niche down your target audience and clearly define who you want to connect with. This includes using specific language that resonates with that audience. Focus on solving real problems for a well-defined audience to increase the effectiveness of that strategy and the SEO around it to drive traffic. It's much easier to be a big fish in a small pond. Don't be afraid to be niche and extremely niched. Number three, content strategy for lead generation. Tailor your content strategy to your audience's preferences. Whether it's video, blogs, or other formats, choose what aligns with your audience and where you can authentically engage. Every piece of content should have a clear connection to an offer or call to action, turning your website into a sales machine. Next, we heard from Ruben Dua, founder of Dub and expert in telling your story with video. He shared many great tips and here are the three lessons from my time with him. Number one, the importance of building trust in communication. Recognizing the current challenge of building trust in in communication and, and really that need to be creative and authentic in doing so. Empathy is all about it. Empathy is crucial, especially in a world of constant communication and bombardment that we have. In order to cut through the noise, you have to have that empathy and people have to feel that resonating from you. Um, Prioritizing creating messages that you as a sender would positively respond to as well too. Number two is the power of video in building connections, right? Adaptability, agility, and nimbleness are more valuable than really alpha status in today's communication landscape. Video allows for a deeper connection for uh, trust building and understanding and showcasing that empathy empathy and uh, addressing challenges authentically. Number three, principles for using video to build that trust. Cut through the noise by building rapport through personalized videos that connect your business world with the recipient's world. Demonstrate value by addressing specific problems your audience faces and offering solutions. Invite prospects for a conversation after establishing rapport and providing your ability to bring that value. And leverage video content for long-term marketing. Record everything Ruben says and then use the data analytics to understand what resonates with your audience. In episode 353, Joe Gizzi shared how he's built one of the fastest growing fintech startups out there. His three lessons include the following. Number one, strategic market understanding and business maximization. Challenge traditional industry theories for your industry. Embrace a dynamic and active approach with all the technology available, including AI automation and providing the or the ability to provide personal solutions for individuals. And utilize a software platform to avoid to offer those tailored services, making it a personal experience. Number two, navigating those business challenges and pivoting effectively. Don't be afraid to break away from reliance on external solutions. If you need to take things in-house, do it. Overcome challenges by securing capital, hiring a dedicated team, and rebuilding critical components when faced with uncertainties. Don't be afraid to pivot. And number three, operationalizing and scaling the business. Adopt the entrepreneurial operating system or a system like it and hire a coach to better operationalize the business. Document and systematize processes comprehensively and allow employees to take ownership and free yourself up to focus on the strengths and passion areas that you have as the leader and the founder. Implement physical responsibility, run a lean operation as best as you can, and build a recurring revenue model for sustainability and growth. Next up, I interviewed Jim Big Red Wietrich about his 40 plus year successful entrepreneurial journey. Jim is a wealth of knowledge and experience, especially on leadership. And my three lessons from him are as follows. Number one, self-awareness. Leadership is the ability to guide individuals, teams, and organizations toward a greater purpose and help them reach their potential. Self-awareness is crucial for leaders acknowledging what you don't know and seeking complementary expertise is a critical, critical thing in doing so. Leaders should avoid the pressure of having all the answers and continually work on self-awareness, preventing ego from hindering their growth. 
Number two, building a great culture. He said a great culture is characterized by openness, visibility of leaders throughout the organization, and honest, open communication. Focus on helping individuals succeed. The success of individuals translates to the success of leaders in the organization. Number three, or point three, was micromanagement hinders success. Effective leadership involves empowering individuals, providing guidance, and allowing freedom from creativity and innovation. Lesson number three are common mistakes that leaders make. Treat people well regardless of their role and avoid negative behaviors like public criticism. Beware of unnecessary meetings as they can be a sign of micromanagement. And leadership prioritize treating individuals respectfully and promoting a positive work environment. After Jim, we had the co-founder of the Nice Guys on Business podcast and serial entrepreneur, Doug Sandler. I've shared the stage with Doug, and he's really an incredible entrepreneur. Here are his three best lessons. Number one, consistency is the key to success. Consistency is a fundamental success clue. Showing up and taking consistent action makes a significant difference every single day. Establish systems to ensure consistency in all aspects of your endeavors. And strive for exceptionalism by maintaining a positive attitude and taking that consistent winning step uh, or steps every single day. Number two, nice guys finish first principles. Success, including being a nice guy, is defined personally. Understanding your finish line is a crucial piece of that. The three pillars for success show empathy, tell the truth with honesty, and work with integrity. Violating these pillars will have consequences. And the third lesson was building great business partnerships. A great partner complements your strengths and picks up the slack where needed. Partnerships strengthen over time when each person's zone of genius complements the other. So focus on staying in your zone of genius and knowing what you love to do. He also said that leaders should catch others in the act of doing well and possibly reinforce their actions. In episode 357, Story Fuel founder Melanie Dizel shared what it means to build real trust in your business. Here are my three takeaways from my time with her. Number one, understanding trust in business. Trust in business involves aligning audience perceptions with the reality of the business. It's imperative to manage audience expectations and ensure they believe in the presented image of the business. Trust is multifaceted, requiring consistency between what a business claims and the evidence that are proving those claims. And then the second point, the second lesson was proving trust, right? So brands that excel in proving trust are those aligned with their purpose and consistently provide evidence of living those values. Patagonia was an example that she shared as a great case showcasing its mission-driven approach through daily content, fostering their strong customer loyalty. And to build trust, companies must understand audience skepticism, offering continuous proof and incorporate it across all advertising channels. Lesson number three, build a complete marketing machine. Shift the mindset to prioritize the importance of providing proof in marketing. Regularly evaluate campaigns against the North Star of proving rather than just stating. Ensure leadership buy-in and commitment to making proof a priority throughout the organization. Joe Rare is, well, rare, having built multiple seven-figure companies that are all completely outsourced. We discussed a number of topics, and here are the three biggest lessons from him. Number one, achieve true freedom in entrepreneurship through some very specific things. He said true freedom in entrepreneurship means having the ability to operate on your terms doing what you love and prioritizing time freedom as the most critical element as it forms the foundation for all their aspects of life. Build your business around your desired lifestyle, reverse engineering it to align with your vision. Lesson number two is outsourcing your business, Joe's model. The key to successful outsourcing business lies in creating a replicable model. Joe's model involves extensive testing and adjustments over about four months, resulting in increased profitability and reduced direct involvement from him. Essential elements include well-documented standard operating procedures through well-written instructions and step-by-step videos, and he outsources everything. And so the third point is how he outsources, right? So here's the guidance for how to outsource. Begin by ensuring your business has a viable product with a market fit before outsourcing. 
architect teams with scalability in mind, considering how they would function with 100 clients, not just one. Identify tasks that you don't want to handle and start with a versatile virtual assistant to manage day-to-day activities. Free your mind to focus on the critical tasks such as selling and business growth. Use reputable companies for outsourcing, invest in trial and error, and establish clear communication and trust with VAs. Strictly enforce communication policies using tools like Slack and track time using software like Time Doctor. Joe's business revival involved outsourcing prospecting and creating a fulfillment team leading to rapid growth when one of his businesses was having trouble. So consider that maybe outsourcing even prospecting and even sales is something that you could do. And lastly, learn from mistakes, avoiding unnecessary tinkering, refrain from fixing what isn't broken, and be cautious about saying yes to too many opportunities. In episode 361, we had a pair of entrepreneurs in Cameron Christensen and Anthony Falso, who built a business teaching entrepreneurs how to have infinite banking and create financial freedom. I love their kind of simple, straightforward approach to all this. And here are those lessons. Number one, definition of financial freedom. Financial freedom is attained when passive income surpasses monthly expenses. Entrepreneurs should aim to build businesses that generate sustainable passive income. Number two, infinite banking. Infinite banking is a cash management strategy using high cash value whole life insurance policies. It involves storing money in a policy, offering tax-free returns, asset protection, and uninterrupted compounded interest. The death benefit, while present, is not the primary focus. It can be used essentially like a bank. This is a bigger topic that's been discussed in a couple episodes. So this is one of those episodes and and others that we have to go listen to learn about how you can, quote unquote, bank on yourself or have infinite banking. This has been around a long time. It's been used by many of the wealthiest people in the world. And it's a, I think, uh, something that everybody should investigate for themselves. As an example of infinite banking, they, they gave an example using $100,000. So if you choose a reputable insurance company, preferably a mutual with a history of dividends, they utilize the ability to overfund the policy. So with $100,000, a one-time payment allows for borrowing $90,000 for investments while that initial amount, that $100,000, continues to compound and grow. So it effectively can pay for itself over time and it has tax benefits. Number three, the third lesson from both Cameron and Anthony were strategies for building true wealth. They said, focus on what you know and have experience in, especially in business or real estate. Investing in real estate does offer a lot of various niches with turnkey real estate suitable for beginners. Exploring avenues like wholesale, flipping, and syndications based on your experience and expertise, and consistency and expertise in a chosen niche contribute to long-term success. You'll notice they didn't say anything about like stocks or mutual funds or anything in there. They're looking at the alternative investments because that's where a lot of true wealth is built as well. So some great points that they made. And something to consider again is this concept around that infinite banking or bank on yourself. Next up was Brian Beers, who has built an empire that really generates, gosh, over 40 plus million per year with what I would call a boring franchise, Midas Repair Centers. Brian shared a lot of actionable advice for building a business, and it was really tough to boil it down to just three lessons, but here they are. Number one, franchising as a focused growth strategy. Franchising provides an advantage with pre-approved systems, management, economies of scale, facilitating rapid growth. Focusing on staying within a specific niche or industry helps streamline operations and creates opportunities to acquire franchises from other franchisees. And building a network of franchises enhances the advantage as it allows for easy scalability and provides a supportive community of fellow business owners. Lesson number two were the benefits of boring businesses. Stability and consistent growth characterize boring businesses, making them attractive options. Lack of disruption, straightforward operations, lower entry costs contribute to that appeal as well. And boring businesses like power washing and things like that offer opportunities to bring professionalism to less professionalized sectors within the industry. Scaling a business from hobby to entrepreneur was the third lesson. And I thought there's some really good points here. Transitioning from a hobby to a scalable business involves replacing 
oneself at each level. So as you build the business, learn and do what needs to be done in each area, then replace yourself and then replace yourself and so on and so on. Focus on higher value tasks and higher individuals who excel in roles being relinquished by you. Continuous growth requires strategic delegation and a commitment to placing the right people in key positions. Cash Hasworth went from prison at 16 to scaling a single mall kiosk to a 28 location franchise that was eventually uh, part of a principal company acquired in a takeover deal that was worth over $640 million. He's been through it all and his three lessons reflect it. The first, the power of adversity and mentorship. Adversity and hardships can be transformative, teaching resilience and building strength. Mentors play a crucial role in personal and entrepreneurial development, providing guidance and making a significant difference in one's journey. Facing fear and overcoming challenges, especially after experiencing adversity, contributes to an entrepreneur's ability to tackle business obstacles and really be better for it. Lesson number two, scaling a business through initiative and, and, and leadership. Kasha's success in scaling that mall kiosk to almost 30 locations was driven by pure initiative and identifying key individuals for different roles. He talked about the FAR approach, F-A-A-R, find, analyze, adopt, refine. And that emphasizes finding the best people, analyzing the best practices, adopting them, and then continually refining those processes. Leadership involves fostering a strong culture, effective communication, authenticity, value elevation, obsessive recruitment of top talent, and responsibility for that employee training and for the success of those employees. And lastly, his last point was selling keeps you broke. And what he said is in sales, the emphasis is on providing customers with all the information needed to make informed decisions. He talked about his evoke method, E-V-O-C, extract, validate, overcome, and close to address objections systematically contributing to successful sales interactions. So if you try to sell, it keeps you broke. But if you are more of a uh, holistic approach and collaborative and coming together to find the best solution together to make a big difference, it pays off a ton, right? Makes a huge difference versus just trying to quote unquote sell somebody. So extract, validate, overcome, and then close. In episode 364, we heard from Elliot and Dom Chapman, brothers who have built multiple global businesses together. I talked to them a lot about building a partnership as a family and a host of other things, and here are the three best lessons that they gave us. Number one, effective business leadership and management across continents. A successful business empire across continents is built on strong leadership and efficient systems. Dom and Elliot position themselves strategically, focusing on high-level decision-making, maintaining a clear vision for each business, and staying in their collective zone of geniuses uh, and complementing each other. Implementing robust standard operating procedures for day-to-day operations is a key to their success, along with empowering teams, encouraging free thinking, and using technology for efficiency. The second lesson was building and nurturing a successful business partnership. Selecting a business partner involves self-awareness, understanding each other's strengths and weaknesses, and finding complementary skills. A great partnership focuses on different aspects, not just the same areas to maximize benefit. The true test of a partnership lies in challenging times, requiring alignment, commitment, strong communication, and shared mission, vision, and core values. So think about this. If you're going to have a partner, and we heard about this from Tannis as well too, you need to have alignment, you need to have commitment, strong communication, and then that shared mission, vision, and core values. If you take the time to do that, you're going to have that foundation to go on and to succeed through those those really big challenges that happen and that will happen as you build a business. And the third lesson from them was on building and scaling businesses. Founders and, and owners alignment from the start is essential for deal success. Trustworthiness is key as people prefer to do business with those that they like and trust. So clearing that 
600 to 700K per year milestone significantly eases the business journey. That was the level for them. They said once they got through that six to 700K a year level, it made things much easier. And I can understand that because at that point, you built systems that work, you've proven a product that uh, is gonna obviously sell, you've got a market, you've got a client base, and so now it gets to be really fun, right? Investing in mentors and avoiding excessive greed were the last points that they make uh, on how to contribute and create long-term business success. Jeff Lerner went from broke musician to doing 50 plus million in business. How did he do it? Well, the answer lies in his three lessons. Lesson number one, his fundamentals of successful entrepreneurship. Successful entrepreneurship revolves around asking the right questions and becoming intentional about the experience people have when working with you. Entrepreneurs should focus on mastering the three key areas of life. Physical, relationship with oneself, personal, relationships with close connections, and professional, indirect relationships that make a difference. Intentionally increasing the value of time and creating surplus income is the most important piece for making a meaningful impact and achieving success. Point number two, or lesson number two, the three by three matrix. The three by three matrix serves as the source code of the life operating system that Jeff goes by. And it consists of three uh, important concepts, what he calls the three P's, physical, personal, and professional, three legs of successful action, knowledge, environment, resources, and three phases of legacy, income, growth, and wealth. Implementation involves organizing relationships with the three P's, starting with mastering the relationship with yourself, that physical. Progressing through the three legs of action and the phases of money. The goal is to be obsessed with increasing the value of time and creating surplus income with a focus on achieving a five to one ratio of income to expenses in the wealth phase. We spent the bulk of the episode talking about this three by three matrix. So if this has piqued your interest, go back and find Jeff's episode and listen to what he talks about here because we covered a lot and it's just way too much to put into you know this area. But this three by three matrix is an incredible way to kind of look at your life in your business. All right, his last point, his last lesson was his best advice for new entrepreneurs. And it's not a surprise, he said prioritize working on the three Ps for personal development, focusing on the physical aspect first. But he also said concentrate on that income phase. Strive for achieving that five to one ratio of income to expenses by investing 40% of your income after taxes. And lastly, he said, identify a specific success vehicle, such as an affiliate or referral marketing, commit to doing the necessary work for that success. Stay focused. In episode 367, Sean DiMartil shared how he left his job as an air traffic controller to build a real estate empire. His formula for doing so was really simpler than I thought, and here are his best three lessons on how to do it. Number one, focus on multifamily real estate. Sean talked about multifamily properties being best due to the economies of scale, allowing for greater resilience during vacancies. Multifamily investments also offer better pricing, similar to buying in bulk and are easier to manage. And his strategy involved uh, involves adding value to the properties, renovating the units and enhancing amenities to increase income and the value of the property. Lesson number two, secrets to find those best deals. Networking with brokers in target markets is a very important piece for discovering these opportunities. Utilizing data analytics platforms like CoStar helps identify inefficiently operated properties as well. And then looking for that value add or what are called like ADU, accessory dwelling unit properties, often older properties with renovation potential or additional units. And his third lesson was around marketing and scaling. He said, hire third party uh, property managers to handle the day-to-day operations, run the business by the numbers relying on data-driven insights, use technology to streamline tasks, automate processes and enhance efficiency, and build trust with investors is gonna take time. So sharing your thought leadership content, such as podcast and you know regular uh, content around what you're doing and how you're doing, showing your authority and what you're learning and building that trust helps to establish that credibility. Oren Klopper has played the long game building a massive business over 20 years that spans across the world. I took a lot from him and here are my top three. 
The first one's the long-term view and a balanced scorecard. So Oren stressed the importance of having a long-term perspective in business. We talk about the long game a lot on the show. It's a recurring theme with misfit entrepreneurs. And he uses a what he calls a balanced scorecard. It's really a performance measurement system to scale his business effectively. Learning to let go and delegating tasks has really become essential for growth and sustained success over so many years. And the second lesson is, is really taking the time to learn from mistakes. We do live in such a fast paced world that it's a lot of times things happen and we just move right on. We don't take the time to think about them, right? So Oren acknowledges in the episode that, you know, mistakes were like made in managing debt, realizing the true cost of it, the importance of understanding financial terms when taking on debt or even uh, investment. And he did an acquisition in 2016 that presented challenges and there were lessons learned in terms of handling like key personnel transitions, implementing new processes, and bringing cultures together. In fact, recognizing the impact of culture on a business and being cautious with aggressive changes during acquisitions is a really key point that he makes. And his third lesson was really about building a positive culture. So Oren recommends Peter Block's book, Community, for insights into building a positive workplace culture, fostering innovation, curiosity, and growth while preserving the individual spirit uh, of each person is essential. Aligning cultural values, purpose, and vision helps tie the team together while autonomy and freedom are crucial for fostering better solutions. In episode 369, we heard from Pavel Stulchik. Pavel's had a really interesting journey making millions and millions of dollars, losing it all, and then making it back again. His journey for deep understanding uh, of self uh, made really the difference and and here are the best three lessons that we took. This is one of those episodes you just kind of kind of listen to because it's really just this discussion about um, being a human, right? And so the first thing that he talks about, the first lesson is really purpose-driven entrepreneurship. So Powell will focus on uh, having a deep and true why for starting a business to avoid that burnout and emptiness that can come along with it. But he also talks about aligning business activities with personal values and integrity for long-term fulfillment. Conscious entrepreneurship involves taking full ownership of choices and consequences, being in the driver's seat of life. The second lesson from him was learning from setbacks and overextension. That's what got him in trouble in his businesses. So he shared some pretty valuable lessons about going broke and the biggest dangers being overextended, the lack of cash flow planning in his business that really brought him down. And he talked about why you got to have a clear focus, especially starting with that why for building a, a business successfully after the setbacks, right? So you really have to get true to once it all comes crashing down if it does then you really got to get true to your why and how you're going to move forward and make it happen right and then his third lesson that i thought was really important was how to have a holistic approach to life and business right he shared what he called the reset method which is an approach to life that involves individual consciousness which is you collective consciousness which is you and those around you and then that super collective consciousness which is the b uh, of what you want to become and the method you know includes really awakening to challenges cleaning up and letting go of the old empowering yourself to make necessary changes and periodic rest and reflection around all this his analogy of frequency really uh kind of shows the power of personal choice in attracting positive or negative experiences this is again just one of those episodes it's really probably fun to listen to after Pablo came Tom Jacobs, and he had to learn how to effectively sell to save his business from going under. And nowadays, he's a top advisor for sales growth to companies around the world. And the three lessons that he gave us were around selling effectively. And the first one is this. You have to transition from selling tactics to conversational problem solving. So traditional approaches of getting prospects to buy until they die are really outdated. The right approach is a conversational, collaborative, problem-solving method. Relying on the tricks and taxi, tactics you know, that have been around forever is really insufficient. The focus should be on a genuine problem-solving phase within a conversation. 
The second lesson about this is around the key components of an effective sales process. It says the sales process is not about personality. It's a structured approach that removes reliance on individual charisma. So identifying the root problem the prospect is facing is crucial. Asking questions in the right order leads to a logical progression, facilitating prospects to willingly ask to make a purchase. His third lesson around selling is the power of storytelling in sales. There's two main types of stories. There's the personal story, why you're passionate about the product and what you do, and then there's those client success stories. And he likes to use the hero's journey framework, you've probably heard of that before, for structuring both personal and client success stories. And he shares what he calls the dramatic impact story framework, which is an iteration of the hero's journey, emphasizing that emotional connection and engagement. So if you haven't checked into these things or you're looking to improve your sales over the next year, your sales organization, this is a great episode to listen to and dig into. In episode 372, Joel Gandara shared how he escaped communism in Cuba and turned his drive really to succeed into millions. And we had a really great conversation, talked a lot about a number of different principles, but the three that I took away that I thought were probably most impactful is number one, overcoming adversity and avoiding a victim mentality. He likes to call it the Rocky Balboa mentality, right? Draw inspiration from characters like Rocky, emphasizing that hard work, seizing opportunities and rising above all the adversity that comes your way. And then reject that victim mentality and face challenges with resilience and determination. Number two, was support systems, accountability, and then building the habits around them. So avoiding kind of that loneliness of being an entrepreneur. And we all know it can be lonely, especially, you know, for us starting out and everything. So you have to seek support. You have to seek that connection. You have to seek those that have been there before you and and look for guidance from them and seek guidance from them. And he emphasizes that need for accountability partners, groups to share the entrepreneurial journey. There's a lot of them out there, but there's also those in your community and, and just maybe people you know that can act as accountability partners for you. And then the last point was about building habits over time. He talked about, again, a little bit the long game here, right? We don't just start a habit and all of a sudden all the changes happen and all the benefits from that habit come to us, right? It has to happen over time. And so he said little habits built consistently over time lead to significant differences. And so he encourages everyone to focus on small daily actions that accumulate into meaningful change. Next up was Dakota Robertson, a kid who's dropped out of college, his parents were crack addicts, and he's become a phenom when it comes to ghostwriting and growing a business online to the tune where he's doing, you know, at this point, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, every few months uh, in this business, uh, you know, just really uh, focusing on it and spending that time and taking the time to really figure out his niche and and really make a difference in how he does it and everything else. So he's figured out a number of like hacks and really unique things for how to really build a presence online. And so we we dug into that a lot with him. So he talked about the uh, keys to building a thriving online presence and business. And so this is my first lesson from him is number one, it's about consistency and passion. So consistency is vital in any venture, but it becomes more sustainable when combined with genuine passion and enjoyment for the work. Choosing the right platform. I think this is interesting. Identify a platform that aligns with your personality and strengths. For Dakota, Twitter was the comfortable space because he was more of an introvert. With a low entry barrier as well, it enabled him to grow his presence and his business effectively and more easily. And then he also talks about effective content creation and idea spotting. He said, master the art of spotting ideas that capture attention. Understand your audience and craft content that resonates, utilizing the frameworks like the what, why, how structure and mixing different content types. And then... Number two from a lesson from him was transitioning from audience building to revenue generating. So obviously you have to build the audience, but then you can start to generate revenue from it. So he talks about earning trust and offering value. And he says, build trust by showcasing an interesting personality and expertise and a chosen skill. Again, you know, be niche, learn and teach simultaneously. Position yourself as a valuable resource to your audience. Diversification of revenue streams. He says, begin with a service-oriented approach, trading your time for money to gain a deeper understanding of your skill, its nuances, and your customer, and then progress to a done-with-you coaching program and eventually create a course based on your expertise. 
And then he said, effective selling and scaling really comes from utilizing a windowed launch strategy to create urgency and encourage action. He said, making the buying process seamless and the offer easy to understand for all the products is, is uh, obviously critical. And then progressing, lastly, from that done for you to that true coaching in the courses side. His third lesson was around the importance of processes and systems. He says, balance that creativity with systems. So recognize the importance of the systems and processes in entrepreneurship and at the same time, look at how they can provide a foundation for the creativity, allowing you to focus on marketing, content creation, and other creative aspects. Delegate and scale. Implementing systems enables efficient delegation of tasks, right? Freeing up time for more creative pursuits. So embrace logic and systems as really an essential component of business growth and scalability. I think everybody who's listened to the show for a while knows that in order to go from that solo entrepreneur or just you know having a uh, essentially a job for yourself as an entrepreneur you have to build those systems and you have to build the the operating procedures and stuff that can be handed off and delegated so that you can scale so that's a running theme that's uh, key to everything and then continuous learning and adaptation right acknowledge the evolving nature of entrepreneurship embrace continuous learning adapt to new tools and systems recognize the synergy between creativity and structured processes he also gave a, a, a lot of framework for how to like use chat GPT to help you in your content and everything else and stuff so it's a great episode if you want to get some of those hacks if you're a content creator. In episode 374, Mark Willis went down the rabbit hole with me on wealth building, sharing how the ultra wealthy manage their money and build wealth. And here are the three top lessons that he shared. He said, number one, rethink wealth building strategies, challenge conventional investment wisdom. He said, question the traditional investment strategies and the hope and pray approach, especially with the limitations and risks associated with 401ks and similar accounts. Mark advocates for a shift away from speculative investments and towards strategies that offer more control and certainty. He also talked about the bank on yourself principles and that we've talked about a little bit already in this episode. He said he introduces that kind of concept of bank on yourself utilizing dividend paying whole life insurance policies as really a modernized financial asset. He emphasized the importance of proper design to maximize the tax advantages that guarantee cash value growth, the life insurance benefits, and the ability to use the policy as a source of financing. And he also talks about his debt snowbank method, which he outlines the four-step process, uh, which really involves diverting extra funds from paying off debts into a bank on yourself policy. The method enables individuals to simultaneously reduce their debt and build wealth in a whole life policy, providing a unique approach to uh, creating financial freedom in the end. His second lesson was navigating investment risk. So he talked about addressing the uh, sequence of returns risk, right? He discussed the risks associated with traditional retirement planning, particularly the sequence of returns risk during the spending phase. He highlighted the importance of using financial tools like annuities and life insurance contracts to mitigate the impact of market downturns. And he also had this analogy uh, uh, essentially to Mount Everest. So he drew parallels between descending Mount Everest and the spending phase of retirement and the need for financial strategies that smooth out those risks during the retirement years because a lot of people don't know the most risky time on a summer of Mount Everest is not going up the mountain. More people die going down the mountain than going up the mountain. And so it's that back half that you need to be safer on, right? So he talks about how, you know, moving to these type of investments can smooth that out and make it a lot easier versus, you know, having a big drawdown or something happening to you right in, uh, you know, that that time of retirement. The third lesson was that long-term perspective and the consistency of it. So he talked about the importance of taking a long-term approach to financial strategies and entrepreneurial endeavors. He acknowledged the slow and steady nature of certain financial tools urging individuals to uh, stay consistent for that prolonged success and really the continuous learning and exploration. So he said, look, things are always evolving. There's so many different vehicles out there for building wealth. You need to continuously learn and explore these, particularly around that financial planning side and entrepreneurship. And so recognize the beauty and empowerment that come from activating your potential and the importance of maintaining that growth uh, oriented mindset. Alex Conception 
had a pretty interesting journey from having no prospects and living with his parents to finding a niche and creating a massive opportunity in the apartment locating space. He uncovered some some great secrets to succeed. And the first one is around foundational principles. So from a from a piece of advice, he says simplicity and com- competency. A business owner doesn't require formal business degrees to succeed. Instead, focus on those foundational principles, understanding the purpose of the business and having a basic level of competency in things like sales and marketing. He also talks about having a problem-solving focus. So businesses exist to solve problems. So to build trust, entrepreneurs must be genuinely committed to providing solutions that people find valuable. Designing business for lifestyle was the second lesson that we took away from him. So clarifying your goals and priorities, your business, depending on what you want to do, can be for your lifestyle. It can be designed to provide you the lifestyle or it can be a big business and grow and perpetuate. It's up to you what you want. And he said the significance though is determining your personal lifestyle goals before designing a business. So understand what you want to optimize for and align business systems and operations to achieve those goals. And he said, focus on really creating those and then encouraging, you know, your those around you to help with that relationship in the business. If you can obviously bring others in to help you in different areas, compliment you for building that lifestyle that you want, then that's obviously a key thing. The third lesson that we took away from him was around risk and opportunity and the perception of it. And He had a mindset shift on risk that I thought was interesting. He said, challenge the common narrative around risk because the opposite side of risk is really where the magic happens. And so instead of solely focusing on the negative, see the risk as the potential for the positive outcomes, the opportunities that are on the other side. He also talked about balancing risk and opportunity. Acknowledge that being an entrepreneur involves navigating both risk and opportunity simultaneously. We must hold the tension between those potential challenges and successes at all times, right? Making decisions based on survivable downsides and high upsides. After Alex, Heidi Schalk shared her story of going from divorce and broke to creating a six-figure money system that she now teaches to entrepreneurs throughout the world. We covered a lot in her episode, and like all the Misfit Entrepreneur episodes, this is really a great one to listen, but here are the three lessons that I took from our time together. The first one, overcoming challenges and mastering mindset. Leading from the heart is a focus of Heidi. She says, when feeling stuck or fearful, lead with the heart. Focus on serving others, helping one person a day. This shifts the mindset from self-centered fear to outward creativity. Gratitude practices and positive self-talk contribute to building the right mindset as well. And then have the courage to take action. Action brings clarity, and even in the face of uncertainty, entrepreneurs should move forward. Shift self-talk to use empowering language like I get to instead of I have to. I really love that. I get to instead of I have to. The second piece of uh, advice that I took from her was her money system for six-figure success, so the acronym MONEY. The M is for marketing. Effective marketing is a strategy. Focus on key steps in marketing to draw in ideal clients. Identify marketing strategies for services, products, and personal brand enhances that visibility and that revenue. The O is for offer creation. Create an irresistible offer. Simplicity and clarity in offers contribute to the buyer understanding. Recommend staying focused on just one offer to avoid confusion. The N is for networking and collaboration. Always be looking to create meaningful connections and collaborations that contribute to business growth. And then the E is enrollment. This is the sales side. Get comfortable with making offers and asking for business. Understand and communicate the value and worth of the business to charge appropriately. And then the why in money is you. It's all about authenticity. Be genuine and create a unique identity that contributes to business success. Create your own blue ocean. And her third lesson that we took away was around just lessons in entrepreneurship. She talked about the competitive edge in giving 100%. Giving 100% consistently is what it takes. Acknowledge the toll it may take and practice that self-forgiveness when it does. She also talked about grace, review, and celebration. Remember grace and forgiveness. Regularly review what is working, what's not. Celebrate the wins along the way. Balancing intense competition with self-compassion is a critical thing. Structure is needed along with discipline required to compete at the highest level. In episode 378, 
Right after Heidi, we went deep into building business systems with Preston Brown and living your best life and his financial freedom formula. We covered so many different formulas in this episode. If you're looking for a masterclass on how to build seven, eight, nine figure businesses, Preston's done it all and he takes you through every one of his different systems in this episode. So here are the lessons that I took away, but this one is another must listen. So we talked about living with purpose and a uh, on purpose. And so emotional awareness. Life is about experiencing compelling emotions and learning new things. Understand that thoughts are indicators of what needs attention. And resolution is a key thing to that. Entrepreneurs should be aware of their emotions and thoughts driven by the subconscious to stay on the right path. He also said, buy into an ideology. Changing belief systems start with buying into a personal crafted ideology. And people are more motivated by ideology than reality. Entrepreneurs should create their own pattern and ideology, defining beliefs that guide their actions. And Preston shares uh, different examples of this and everything as well, like seeing problems as gifts. And then to round this, this one out, he talked about forgiveness as personal growth. Forgiveness is viewed as a personal sport that requires internal processing. Letting go of attachments and expectations tied to past behaviors is essential for personal growth. Preston also talks about the importance of forgiveness and freeing oneself from emotional anchors. And his second piece of wisdom that I thought was really uh, pretty Im impactful, especially in the episode, came around building those formulas and the philosophy around business. So. He has four things that are important, efficiency, alignment, simplicity, and foresight. So it's his problem-solving formula for business, efficiency, alignment, simplicity, and foresight. Efficiency is the ultimate goal in a business, with alignment and simplicity contributing to that optimization. The paradox, as he says, lies in compromising alignment for simplicity and vice versa. Foresight is critical for that long-term success. So you have to be looking out ahead a year, two, three, four, five, six years while optimizing and keeping things simple now so that the business continues to grow and run the most optimal. He also talked about his four business management pillars. And those pillars are culture, clarity, capacity, and cash. These components encompass the essential aspects that really make up a business. He highlighted the importance of focusing on these elements to build a strong foundation. And when it came to culture, he said it's like a cult, not in a negative sense, but in terms of devotion and loyalty. Balancing that safety and danger is a key thing to that, but entrepreneurs really need to be uh, dangerous to create that safety for their teams and stakeholders, right? Quality of narrative, mission, vision, and values are absolute imperatives in shaping a powerful company culture. And then the last piece of wisdom we took surrounded his financial freedom formula. He said there's got to be a mindset shift for solopreneurs. Solopreneurs must solve the mindset problem before moving into the true startup phase. Operational entrepreneurs, who essentially own a job, need to focus on optimizing and systematizing their operations to transition to true financial freedom. And scaling is considered an art, and entrepreneurs really learn to scale uh, effectively by learning to transition to that operational kind of mega premier phase that involves mastering sales, hiring professionals to run the business. Achieving financial freedom really requires entrepreneurs to remove themselves completely from day-to-day -day operations and focus on systemization. We rounded out the year with some incredible entrepreneurs. First was Rob Green, who has built a massive business on Amazon selling hundreds of millions. His three best lessons for building a brand on Amazon are as follows. Number one, strategic product development on Amazon. Use a demand-centric approach. Building a brand on Amazon begins with understanding and tapping into existing demand. You can use tools like Jungle Scout or Helium 10 to analyze product data, validating markets where there is sufficient demand. There's a common mistake of creating products without substantial demand for Amazon sellers. Sentiment analysis for product improvement, leveraging AI tools such as sentiment analysis on customer reviews allows sellers to identify opportunities for product improvement. By analyzing consumer feedback in common phrases, entrepreneurs and Amazon sellers can really enhance their products, providing a competitive edge. 
And for effective supply chain navigation, he talks about sourcing products, attending trade shows, provides valuable insights and ideas. Humility and curiosity are key when interacting with suppliers. Tools like importyeti.com and direct communication with suppliers help sellers find reliable manufacturers. And if you identify gaps in existing products and improve them, that allows for differentiation in the market so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. His second piece of, uh, or lesson, is around marketing and sales optimization. Choosing the right distribution channel. Sellers really need to focus on their strengths when it comes to marketing. Whether excelling in influencer marketing, pay-per-click ads, or other channels, finding the right distribution strategy is critical. So maintaining a strong presence on platforms like TikTok and optimizing Amazon listings for visibility and conversion rate are key components of that. He also talked about a recurring revenue model. So if you can incorporate a recurring revenue model and encourage uh, that where possible with products, it enhances sustainability in your customer retention. It may not be applicable for all product types, and a lot of products on Amazon aren't recurring. The subscription model, though, provides an opportunity for that consistent revenue stream and in continuing that loyalty and growth of, of the business. And strategic visibility and conversion. So visibility on Amazon is considered really digital real estate. Entrepreneurs, sellers got to aim to be in the top five to gain traction. So optimizing product listings by understanding the algorithms, using persuasive copy and appealing with images and things like that are, are really essential. The focus is on capturing consumer attention and converting into sales. The third lesson that we took away is around mindset and time management. So. Limiting beliefs and overcoming them. The primary challenge for entrepreneurs is mindset. Rob really emphasized the prevalence of limiting beliefs that hinder personal and professional growth. Entrepreneurs are encouraged to create a board of directors and uh, support network for feedback and perspective, challenging themselves to think bigger. And I think that's one of the most important lessons for any entrepreneur is to constantly challenge yourself to think bigger. John Ostensen, ranked as the number one franchise broker in America, was next and gave us some excellent insights in franchising. If you've ever considered a franchise business, this episode is a must listen. Here's his top three. Benefits of franchising. Proven system and support. John really talked about how franchising offers entrepreneurs that proven system with a support structure for success. And by joining a franchise, individuals start essentially on third base with a playbook that has been proven in various markets. This includes access to best practices, established processes, and a supportive network providing a significant advantage over starting a business from scratch. He also talked about the economies of scale and resale value. Franchise owners benefit from really having those economies of scale by being part of a larger network. And that includes the buying power, the shared resources. And additionally, franchises tend to have higher resale values, uh, trading at about one and a half times more than non-franchise businesses. This provides that additional financial gain for entrepreneurs if or when they decide to exit the business. Risk mitigation and financial models are a plus as well, right? Franchising reduces risk by offering a ready-made business model. And entrepreneurs and uh, business owners have access to those financial models, competitive advantages, and that proven track record really from day one. So it eliminates the need to figure out these aspects independently. The franchise model provides kind of that structured approach to business ownership, but it's not for everybody. And so when John talked in our point two about evaluating a franchise, he said, evaluating a franchise requires really comprehensive due diligence, considering factors such as financial models, competitive advantages, and owner testimonials. John su suggests really looking into the leadership team's blend of industry and franchise expertise because it's critical to understand the financial aspects, including the all-in investment, which is con typically considered item seven on what's called the FDD, and historical financial representations, which is item 19. And the FDD is the franchise disclosure document that you get when you review a franchise. But every... Uh, one could have red flags too, so you should involve a franchise attorney to navigate the legal aspects of franchising. Legal scrutiny, especially regarding the FDD, helps 
uncover potential red flags, other issues. You need to understand the royalties, the post royalty margins, and ensuring that there's legal clarity for you know all the areas. So he emphasizes the importance of really comparing those FDDs from different franchises and seeking that legal, legal guidance. And John says that he has a focus and has found that some of the best opportunities are what called non-food franchising due to the better margins and resilience in various economic conditions. So non-food business such as those related to home and property services tend to have more consistent demand. John speaks to the wide range of opportunities with non-food franchising from insulation to dumpsters and even floor coating. So if you're interested more, you can listen to that. The third point that he makes uh, is on ownership styles and training. So kind of going back to what we said before, it's not for everyone, but there's three ownership styles. There's the owner operators, there's semi-passive or semi-absentee, and then there's those investors or impassive owner type franchise. Understanding those styles really helps people align their preferences with the right franchise opportunity. So transparency is crucial and entrepreneurs should have no surprises during the exploration process, but visiting the home office and talking to existing owners really helps provide valuable insights into the training process and the items that you should understand about owning one of the franchises. He talked about absentee ownership, right? It wouldn't be nice to just not have to set foot and own the franchise and have it work for you and create uh, you know, uh, financial freedom and all of that. And he talked about how it's rare but semi-passive or semi-absentee is more realistic option for many franchises. Entrepreneurs can put a manager in place from day one, and true passive ownership is even rarer, but it does exist in a few select franchises. So John recommends choosing a model that aligns with the individual goals and your preferences. And John works in an interesting way. If you have an interest in working with him, he has a consulting model that has no cost for the client. So you don't pay John anything, the franchises pay John. Uh, when a purchase is made, similar to kind of like a real estate model. So John collaborates with over 600 top franchise opportunities, really uh, understanding the broad range of options that are out there. Our last two Misfit Entrepreneurs of the Year were Adam House and Kevin Serace. Adam House has built multiple seven-figure companies by the time he was 30, and he had multiple exits, so he decided to pursue his dream of actually playing professional sports and basketball. Here are three lessons that I took from him. Number one, start making decisions. The key to success is to start making decisions. Many many entrepreneurs suffer from analysis paralysis and Adam really talks to the fact that the importance of taking action is making a decision, right? Decisions lead to action, action generates feedback and this feedback helps in making better decisions in the future. It's not about making only the right decisions, even bad decisions can pave the way for better ones by providing valuable data and feedback. Number two, embrace the struggle zone for growth. So embrace the tr- the struggle zone, as he likes to call it, for growth. We should all recognize that a significant portion of our time, about 70%, is spent in what Adam calls the struggle zone, or framed as kind of the growth zone. This is where the real growth, innovation, and best ideas can happen. So getting comfortable with being uncomfortable is a huge part of success. Entrepreneurs need to navigate the challenges and uncertainties with a a mindset focused on growth rather than viewing struggles as obstacles. And then lastly, build a solid foundation and avoid shortcuts. Adam emphasizes the importance of building a foundation for success without taking any shortcuts. This involves doing the small things consistently and over time to create a substantial impact. Every entrepreneur should surround themselves with successful individuals who can hold them accountable. Additionally, Adam likes to talk to the significance of understanding corporate structure, shareholder agreements, and consistency uh, making uh, daily small efforts to compound that success over time. So building a business is not about gimmicks or anything like that. It's about consistent effort and sound foundational principles. It was great to end the year with Kevin Saray, serial entrepreneur and futurist who spent a lifetime in Silicon Valley. We went deep into AI and lessons learned on Kevin's journey, and here are my top three takeaways. Number one, embrace curiosity for continuous learning. Kevin really talks to the power of curiosity as a fundamental driver for success in entrepreneurship. 
Being curious is not only essential for personal growth, but it's also a key trait of effective leadership. Successful leaders continuously seek to learn from those who have come before them and actively inquire about how to improve. At its core, curiosity is a drive to keep learning and growing, a quality crucial for entrepreneurial success. In the discussion about AI, point number two is really understanding that evolving landscape that's out there around this topic. Kevin talks to the current state and, and future of artificial intelligence. He he really clarifies that AI is not a singular concept, but encompasses various forms with advancements recently driven by deep learning models. While AI has made significant progress, especially in specific tasks such as like image recognition and things like that, it still lacks true understanding or context. Kevin talks and, and says the importance of being cautious about the potential misuse of AI, uh, and he does talk about the need for human oversight in its applications because it can be used for you know the wrong type of things, but it's typically humans that are using it that way. And then the third point that uh, Kevin made, probably the most important one when it comes to building a business is he really talks about the implications of AI and advises entrepreneurs to build business with a sustainable advantage or moat because a lot of businesses that are popping up today are not going to be here tomorrow because AI will surpass them quickly. He suggests that businesses that are relying solely like on an AI application are going to face challenges very, very quickly. Having a unique and defensible aspect to your business is really critical for long-term success. Success. Entrepreneurs are really encouraged to leverage AI for tasks like responding to emails, creating content, and solving challenges, but the focus should be on building a distinctive and resilient business model. Kevin ends with saying the importance of humility in business, acknowledging that learning from failures is an integral part of the entrepreneurial journey. It's fitting that we end this episode talking about the future and the incredible power of curiosity. After all, what is entrepreneurship but curiosity about how to impact the future and make a difference? And that brings me to my final thoughts for you. I love doing this show with you and I truly, truly enjoy it. And it's my goal to help you become your best. I want you to have everything that you've ever dreamed of. I want you to experience the true wonder that this life and world has for you. I want you to succeed further than you ever thought possible. And I want you to share your success, wisdom, and experience with others all over the world to help them and find it for themselves. I started the show because I wanted to give my daughter... Hannah, a place where she could go and learn from her daddy and his misfit friends long after I'm dead and gone. But it's become so much more. The mission has grown as I truly, truly believe one great episode can change someone's life, and it can. Doing this has changed my life. This is one of the greatest experiences that I've ever gone through in working with all of you out there. And I hope that you feel the same. There is literally a master's class or two in entrepreneurship, life, and business in this year's episodes. But here's the thing. The beauty of it is you don't have to know it all. There's an episode not just from this year, but from many years past focused on just about every type of thing you need to overcome and do to succeed in your career, your business, your life, and so on. So like I said, just know that you always have a place to go when you need it. Know that the Misfit Entrepreneurs are here for you and I'm here for you. My mission is to create an episode every single week that has the potential to change someone's life, your life, and give you everything that you need to be your best. All you have to do is take the information and act on it. I said at the beginning and I want to say it now. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for listening, for watching, and for your support. And don't be a stranger. Keep us in the loop on how you're doing and how we can better help you by sending us emails or comments and connecting with the show on all of our social media, obviously following us on YouTube, sharing episodes that you like with others, and help get these entrepreneurs' messages out, these misfit entrepreneurs. And if you get a chance, support our sponsors if they can help you and go out and give the show a rating and review like and comment on it. It is much appreciated. Here is to a wonderful, wonderful 24 for you. I am so blessed to have you in my life. And I know that you have more potential for greatness beyond anything that you ever ma imagined. So as we get ready into 2024, it's going to be your best year yet. Now go out there, be relentless and take action every day and make your dreams become a reality.